Now there's a fairly common electrical installation. A lot of times it happens more so in like garages or metal buildings or add-ons. And that's where it comes down to installing these metal boxes and making our connections inside of them. Well, in this box right here, I have quite a few very dangerous situations that are occurring and some very common mistakes that a lot of DIYers don't realize they're making when they're installing these boxes and making their connections. So in this video, I'm gonna go over what each of these mistakes are that are going on in this box. And then I'm also gonna show you the proper way and some better practices to avoid this dangerous situation and make sure that we have very good and long lasting connections for many years to come. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Alrighty, so here is my pre-made up box and in it is containing those very common and really big mistakes that a lot of people make when they start wiring up these types of boxes. So I'm gonna give you a quick opportunity here to kind of take a look at it, see if you can spot all of the mistakes, and then we're gonna go over each and every one of them. All right, so for this first mistake, this is probably one that many of you noticed, and that's if we flip the box over here to the side, you'll see this cable going into the box through this hole, and we do not have anything that is holding this wire in place. If we look up here at the top, we do have a proper clamp and some strain relief up there, but obviously over here on the side, we have none of that going on. This cable is just free to be moved around. It can get cut on the metal. It can be pulled on. And instead of the strain relief being here, a lot of it is on our connections. And that's never a good thing. So there are a couple of different ways that this can be addressed. Obviously going back to this clamp up here on the top, this is a proper strain relief. This is a proper cable clamp that should be installed with this wiring over here. And what that looks like more up close is this right here. We've got a locking nut on this. This is what holds it into the box. And then on this side, as you can see, we've got two screws, one on each side. We also have what's basically like a vise or a piece of metal that then gets clamped down into place as we tighten down these screws. So I've punched this knockout over here on the side to kind of demonstrate how these are installed. Super easy to do. We just take the male threading with the locking nut off of it, take that male threading, push it through that knockout hole, and then we just take our locking nut get it started on those male threads, and then we can go ahead and tighten it all the way down so it's nice and tight up against the box. And so once that is installed just like we have it, it's at that point, then you just run your wiring through that clamp into the box and then tighten down each one of the screws on both sides of the clamp connector. Then once those screws are completely tightened down, that cable is locked into place and it would take quite a bit of force in order to be able to now pull that cable out. So now we've got very good strain relief. We don't have to worry about our cable being pulled on, any tension on our connections. And so this is one of the proper ways in order to make sure that your wiring is secured when it is entering into one of these metal boxes. Now, another option that can address this issue is they also make some plastic NM connectors that do pretty much the exact same thing. And I've demonstrated this in a previous video, so I'll have that up on screen, where you just take that plastic plastic NM connector, you pop it into the knockout hole. It needs to be popped in in the proper direction from the outside going in. And then you just feed your cabling through that plastic NM connector. And then once it's inserted in, it's locked into place as well. And you have some good strain relief there as well. Those, however, are pretty much just a one-time use. So that is another really good option. All of these are very inexpensive. I personally like the metal clamp connectors better than the plastic ones, but the plastic ones are approved, they work very well, and they are a little bit quicker to install. And like always, I'll have links for those along with everything else that you're gonna see in this video. I'll have links for everything down in the description down below, and when you click on those links, it'll take you directly to whatever you clicked on, so you can check it all out for yourself. All right, so now coming down to our second big mistake, I would argue that this is probably the most common one that people are making when they're installing these boxes and running their wiring. And that comes down to the ground wires. Do you see an issue with my grounding that's going on in this box? Yeah, if you know what you're looking for, you would notice that my grounding wires, they are all spliced together, but my box is not grounded anywhere. When you have a metal box, obviously with it being metal, it can conduct electricity. And if a hot wire was to somehow get loose in this box and make contact with the box and the box is not grounded in any way, then that will electrify the box and then you run the risk of if you touch that box or the possible metal cover that you have on the box, which is very easy to do, then you in fact then would become the ground and you would receive a shock or possible electrocution. So I'll show you really quickly what that should look like. And on most of 
of your metal electrical boxes, you are going to find somewhere in the back of that box where there is a threaded hole that is really designated for where you should be bonding a ground wire to. And the majority of the time, if I just pull these ground wires out of the way, in behind this wire nut, you will see there is basically like a mound or a hill that is up and there is a threaded hole right in the middle of it. These other holes, again, are just for mounting the box. So in order to ground this box, we would need to take a ground wire and connect it to our grounds that are coming in and going out of the box and connect it then to the box itself. This can be very easily done by just taking some scrap wire like this right here, making a ground pigtail out of bare copper wire. And then in order to install that bare copper wire, you would need one of these green grounding screws. Now there's nothing really special about the green color. In most places, it would not be necessary for the screw to actually be green. You might wanna check your local code though because they might have some local codes that do require that the grounding screw be green in color. But in most cases, the color doesn't really matter. It's the type, size, and length that really actually matters. And so these are 1032 by 3 8 But in my opinion, there's really no reason to just go out and buy that size of screw. You can very easily pick up these green ground screws in the electrical aisle of your local home improvement store or online, which like I said, I'll have links for everything down below. And I recommend doing it that way and picking these up because in that case, you will know for sure that you have the proper screw and size. And they really aren't any more expensive than if you were to just go to the hardware section and buy that size. And this is what you would be looking for or something very similar. There are different brands. Or another really great option is you can purchase these already made. We've got our green grounding screw already up here. We've actually got some insulated ground wire here. So in some places that might also be required. So again, always check your local code. Whichever way you decide to do it though, you're gonna need to do these next steps. That's taking whichever ground wire you're deciding to use we need to put a J hook on that ground wire like that. Then I personally like to make up my own grounding wires like the one that was pre-manufactured that I just showed a moment ago. So I'll put my green ground screw in that shepherd's hook like so. When I do this though, I wanna make sure that my ground wire is wrapping around that green ground screw in a clockwise direction. Then I just take my wire strippers, the points of them or some needle nose pliers and crimp down that J hook on that ground wire so it's in there nice and tight on its own. Then I take that green ground screw, put it on top of that mound or hill again where that threaded hole is, put that green ground screw inside of it, and then just start to hand tighten it to get the thread started. And then I'll get my screwdriver and tighten it down the rest of the way to where it's down nice and tight and I really can't tighten it anymore. All right, so now my ground pigtail is attached to my metal box. Now I just need to take this wire nut off of my ground wires, take my new grounding pigtail that's going to the box, put it with those wires. And at this point, there's a couple of different options. I can either install a new wire nut. I don't wanna reuse the one I just took off. So I can install a new wire nut and twist these all together and make sure that they're getting a nice joint formed underneath of it. I can pre-twist these first and then put this wire nut on. Or if you're somebody that likes to use Wagos, obviously you could use Wagos here. So I'm just gonna go ahead, put my new wire nut on top there. So that right there would be sufficient. We got some nice braiding going on down below. And so now at this point, I could push my wire nut or WAGO, whatever connector was used, into the back of the box. And now my box is completely grounded and in a safe condition to where again, if a hot lead gets loose in this box, makes contact with the wall, it will go to the ground wire, back through the wires to the circuit breaker panel and ground it out by tripping that circuit breaker. All right, so for this next really big mistake, it comes down to where this WAGO connector is over here. And can you spot any issues with the WAGO connector or the wires with the WAGO connector, anything over here on this side of the box. Yeah, so the mistake that's going on here would take a pretty trained eye in order to locate, and that comes down to this wire right over here that we have set up as a pigtail. We're pretending that this is a 20 amp circuit with our 12 gauge wire coming in here, that we're gonna install a 20 amp receptacle here, and so that's why you see these pre-made pigtails right here those are to connect to the receptacle. Well, the mistake that's made here, and I know I'm gonna get some pushback on this because there's different situations where this might be okay, but the problem with this is this pigtail over here that's gonna be going to our 20 amp receptacle, if you notice, the wire is a little bit thinner than these two over to its right. That's because this is 14 gauge wire 
and these two are 12 gauge wire. And if you're installing a 20 amp circuit and you're planning on putting a 20 amp receptacle or something similar to that amperage draw, using a 14 gauge wire like this, which is designed for 15 amp circuits and receptacles, is not gonna cut it. If you plug like a heater into that 20 amp receptacle or you're actually utilizing above 15 amps through that receptacle, this wire is not rated for that amperage and it runs a very high risk of causing this to heat up too much and start a fire. Now where I'm gonna get a little bit of pushback on this is on certain load dependent installations, 14 gauge wire running to a specific device would not be an issue. So say for instance, this is a light fixture box and obviously the light fixture is not gonna take 20 amps in order to operate it. Well, the manufacturer is usually already going to include a cord with it that is rated for the load or the current that that device is going to pull. And so in those types of situations where you have a manufacturer that has already predetermined the load of what's being installed, then that would be code compliant. But when you're doing something like this, in the vast majority of cases, it is not code compliant, and at the very least, it can cause confusion for future homeowners and people that are working on this. So what actually should be here is instead of this 14 gauge wire, I'll lift up this lever on the WAGO, pull that 14 gauge wire out, take a scrap of 12 gauge wire and make a pigtail out of it, take one end, insert it into the WAGO where the 14 gauge wire was, or wire nut or whatever splicing device you're choosing to use. But in this case, flip the lever down on that WAGO, now that's connected into place. And now we have the proper wiring for the installation that's taking place here. So again, especially if you're not an electrician, never mix different gauges of wire. It's always best to use the same wiring that's already being run into the box so that it matches up with the wiring that is on that circuit. All right, so for this next big and very common mistake that is made, not just in metal electrical boxes, but pretty much any electrical box that's being installed, this is super, super common, and many of you have probably spotted the other issue that's in this box. I'll give you a moment really quick to take a look what you think it is. And yeah, it comes down to the wire length of each of these wires. Now, some of them are probably close to where code needs to be or even right at it, but some of them are not. Code states very specifically that you need to have at least six inches of wiring coming from where it's entering the box and exiting the sheathing. And on top of that, you also need to make sure that you have at least three inches of wire that extend past the front or the face of the electrical box. So some of my longest wires in this box are my black ones. So let's just take a tape measure and measure how long these actually are. As you can see from where it's entering into the box and exiting that sheathing, it is just over four inches long. So these wires along with the other wires in this box are going to be below that six inch threshold. So if your wall is still exposed and you still have access to your cable clamps, and if there's a little bit of slack, you might be able to pull some extra wiring into your boxes. If in most cases, at least here in the US, they oftentimes do not install service loops, so you probably won't have a whole lot of slack and it's gonna be stapled down in a lot of places, you might not be able to pull any extra in. The only other options really are to just extend the wires. And one of the ways that can be very easily done is by either using Wagos or wire nuts taking an extra piece of wire, making a longer pigtail out of it, exposing your leads. Then for instance, you can take one of these inline connectors that are made by Wago or a standard Wago or again, a wire nut. We'll just connect it into this Wago like so. Make sure it's got a good connection. Flip that lever down. It's locked into place. And then take my black leads that are in the box, take that strip of wire and Wago, put the other end onto the end of one of the leads that are in the box, verify a good connection, flip that lever down, and now I have brought this to code compliance. Now, obviously I can trim this down so that it will all fit in the box better, but you get the idea as to an option for bringing your box and your wiring up to code in the event and the very common event that the wires that are in the box are just too short. But now let's talk about a couple of mistakes that are existing here right now that didn't exist before. So one of those is obviously I punched this hole out to demonstrate 
installing one of the cable clamps, but you'd be surprised how many people there are knockouts missing in their electrical boxes, their circuit breaker panels, whether they had something in here and they removed it and they removed the wiring. This especially is true in your circuit breaker panel, so this would apply there as well, but you cannot just leave one of these holes open like this. They actually make plugs that will go into these electrical boxes and your circuit breaker panels to fill that void and make sure that this box is enclosed. And that goes to then the next point of when you go to install a receptacle or maybe you're just making a junction in a box, you cannot just leave it open like this. It has to have some sort of an approved covering on it. Obviously a cover plate would be the best thing in order to install this. If you're installing a receptacle, you're gonna to wanna to do the same thing. Make sure you're getting the proper plate for the box that's being installed and just make sure that these boxes are completely enclosed. Otherwise, you would be violating code by either having a knockout that is still missing and nothing going into it, or not having an enclosed box like this one. And again, just really quickly, I get a lot of people asking me where I get a lot of my materials and my tools from. And like I mentioned earlier, for your convenience, everything you saw in this video from the tools and the different materials, I'll have links for all of it down in the description down below. When you click on those links, it will take you directly to whatever you clicked on so you can check it all out for yourself. Now, if you found value in this video, then you'll definitely find value in some videos that I did in the past where I go over some more or very common mistakes that a lot of homeowners and DIYers don't realize they're making when taking on some of these electrical projects. So I'll post two videos of the biggest and most common mistakes that DIYers make. I'll post both of those right over here. Whichever one of these interests you the most and you decide to click on, it will take you directly to that video. But I hope that you found value in this video. And if you did, if you could do me a huge favor, hit that thumbs up button right down below. And of course, if you have any questions or comments still, you can leave those down in the comment section. And I'll catch you all in the next one. See ya.